Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 136 of Real Blend, a podcast that would like to know, Jake Hamilton, if you can name all seven of the deadly sins from David Fincher's seven. Ooh, wrath, lust, envy, greed, sloth, gluttony, uh, vengeance? No, uh, no, that's wrath. That's wrath is basically vengeance. He was oh, envy. No, I did envy. I'm trying to think of all the murders. But the fat, uh, fat guy was sloth. Lawyer was, lawyer was greed. The prostitute was lust. The who am I forgetting? I think it's this is great radio. It's pride. I think it's pride. Oh, <laughs> is that the one you missed? It's really good. Hi everyone. My name is Sean O'Connell, and I'm okay. Six that, out of seven ain't bad. No, it's pretty good. It's actually better than I was going to do because I did five before we got started. Um, I brought that up because it's the 25th anniversary of uh, David Fincher's. Masterpiece uh, Seven, and he um, my the favorite film of his that we want to get onto this podcast. So I hope we get there. Uh, but he's not on this week because this week we have a Wandavision trailer. We're going to be re- uh, reacting to the Emmys and some of the takeaways from that. And I know we're not a big TV show, but there's some really cool television that we're all watching. Um, Aaron Sorkin's Trial of the Chicago Seven is going to open in about seven theaters, and we're going to talk about it very briefly uh, and get you guys set up for it. And then we have an interview. This week with Matthew Modine, uh, who was talking to us about uh, the 4K, primarily the 4K of Stanley Kubrick's uh, Full Metal Jacket. But then we also get some really great stuff out of his collaborations with Christopher Nolan and other stuff from his career. By we, I mean, uh, I'm going to start with Kevin McCarthy because he's wearing my uh, Zack Snyder's Justice League sweatshirt today. Hi, Kev. Kev is from Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hi, Kev. Hi, Sean. Yeah, I sleep in this sh- uh, sweatshirt every night, and I just, I-, I say your name as I'm falling asleep. Oh, it's, good. I yeah, love it's, that. You know, it's, uh, Lauren thinks it's weird. I'm sure, but, I'm sure Lauren yeah. loves that. Yes. Yeah. And on the other side of the bed, I also think it's weird. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's Jake Hamilton of Fox 32 in Chicago wearing yet another real blood shirt. I love it, Jake. You know, it's weird. I, you know, I was thinking about the Modine interview. You know, that what for people that don't know us, you know, our source of pride, sort of what what I always tell people is our drug is being told by someone, oh, that's a great question, or oh, yeah. I've never been asked that before. <laughs> My leadoff question to Modine, do you remember what he said? Ah, yes. Everyone was, asks me this. I've been asked this a million times. He actually and I just says, like, oh. I've been asked this question so many so times. Many times I, I wrote let... it into a book. <laughs> I don't know why I was thinking about that just like <laughs> earlier today or yesterday. I was like, oh, man, yeah, because it makes such a big deal out of it. Whenever someone says, like, oh, that's a great question. I've never been asked that. But to get the yeah. complete opposite side of that was yeah. astounding. <laughs> and when you told us what the question was, I was like, oh, that's really good. I do want to kind of know that. And then he he really just shut it down. <laughs> Not only have I been asked that before, I've been asked it so many times that I wrote it into a book so that no Ugh. dumbass would ever ask me that question ever again. It was great. Well, you'll hear it uh, momentarily in the show. So um, if you're watching us right now, I want to point out the fact that we are over on YouTube. And thank you very much for joining us uh, for these video presentations. Head on over there. If you're watching us right now on the YouTube channel, give us a like and a subscribe. Join us here each week. You can also subscribe to our Clips channel that we have on YouTube. If you're listening to us on audio and you want to join us in video form, check out the show notes for more information on the two YouTube channels, which we hope you guys will go over there and join. And of course, we are available as a reminder um, where all your podcast needs are met. Uh, Weekly poll. Okay, this was pretty interesting. I asked the folks on Friday if they would pay $30 to rent Black Widow on Disney Plus. This is stemming from the conversations we've been having on the show about the fact that new releases are struggling coming to theaters, debating whether it's worth coming to theaters. There was a uh, story kind of circulating that Soul and uh, Black Widow were looking at uh, shifting their release dates. So I put it out there. Kev, what do you think? I gave the people simple yes or no. Where do you think the people leaned? I mean, in... I think 100% yes, people would pay $30 to watch Black Widow at home right now, for sure. I mean, Mm -hmm. now, it's an interesting question. It depends on when you're asking it, right? If you're asking it right now, I feel Mm -hmm. like for sure. I mean, maybe five, six months ago, people would have been like, okay, we'll wait it out to see what happens. I don't know. I I don't know that Black Widow has... Black Widow almost kind of falls in between that category of a film that like that that you could possibly see go to Disney Plus. You know what I mean? Like in the sense but, of. But I feel like we say that now, but six months ago, we wouldn't have said that. 
Well, six months ago, that, we would have said it's absolutely not going to VOD. Well, I think you would have said the same thing about Mulan six months ago. Sure. Oh, absolutely. Right. So I, I think the, the only thing I will say about Black Widow is that Black Widow does not have the anticipation level of an Avengers or right. um, even a even Captain Wonder Marvel Woman. or a Wonder Woman. Um, I think that Black Widow is a prequel, so the stakes aren't as high. So I think that there's not as much story that people are concerned about. I know that Black Widow will have story implications for future MCU films. I know, uh, Sean, you've discussed that and it's going to play into what we see in Falcon and Winter Soldier and WandaVision yeah, yeah. and all those all those shows. But I, I just I, I, I for some reason, I feel like Black Widow falls into a bit of a category where it would be like an in-between type of film like it might. But I would say, yes, people would pay thirty dollars to watch that on Disney Plus this weekend. No question. Fifty four percent said no. So, really? So no wow, one. Good. But and, and also, to 45. I, have you good. guys been seeing a lot of conflicting reports about how well Mulan has done? The only I, report I saw, I saw was the one that said it did extremely well. I, I saw didn't... one that said it did extremely well, and then I saw one that said it's not doing well at all. And one, they, they I mean, and this is in regards to how well it's doing on Disney Plus, because in China, where I think they were counting on it doing substantially well, it's not. Yeah, it it's doing. Work. It's doing very poorly. Right. Um. So, uh, so I've, I've, I'd love to see what the Disney Plus numbers are. There's two questions at stake here. So let, let's let's use Wonder Woman as a, as a better example. Wonder Woman 1984. Okay. okay. If 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 that was given the go ahead to go to Disney Plus to rent it for thirty dollars right now, I think that a lot of people would watch it. There's no okay. question. Um, sure. I do think Wonder Woman though is in that is in that field of of movie where it's going to it's going to be have to be seen on the big screen, not saying Black Widow doesn't need to be seen on the big screen, but just based on the cameras Patty Jenkins used for Wonder Woman 1984 and things like that. But there is something to be said about the question you're asking. Is, is it a question of want, meaning that would you just bend and just watch the film now if you could for thirty dollars? Or I guess the other question would be, or would you want to see it in theaters? So it's a, yeah. I, I think it's a matter of need at this point. Like, what are you, what do you want to do at this point? I, I'd rather go to a movie theater to see Black Widow personally, but right. I feel like Black Widow would have more of a, Black Widow would have more of a, less of a problem going to Disney Plus than I think Wonder Woman would have going to VOD. I, for whatever reason, and I don't know. W w yeah, I, I can't answer this with, the, with Wonder Woman because my opinion, I guess, I'm an, on it is different. I would honestly pay, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, I would double that. I would pay $60 to watch Black Widow right now. Okay. Right now. So well, how much would you pay to watch Wonder Woman right now? Probably $30. i would probably set it at that $30 price point. If someone, um, if you weren't in this job and someone offered you Wonder Woman 1984 for $60 in your home right now, what would you, what would you do? For $60? Ba okay, so I'm basing it just on the trailers that I've seen, right? Just on the trailers I've seen. And also, is it going to come out in theaters <laughs> later, or like, is this is this what we're getting? Well, I think that's kind of the Tenant question, right? Uh, if, te if so, right now, Tenant's in theaters. Will they eventually re-release Tenant once theaters yeah. reopen more? So uh, let let let's give it the let's give it the asterisk of yes, it will maybe come. It will come out in theaters maybe sometime next year, so you can experience it on the big screen if you want to. But right now, I will now, say this. I think Black Widow looks better than Wonder Woman 1984 right now. I think Black Widow has better trailers than Wonder Woman 1984. Yeah, I actually so agree with you on that. Yes. I'm more intrigued by Taskmaster than I am by Cheetah. Um, I want to see what Florence Pugh does um, yeah. and the Widow program. I like David Harbour a lot uh, yeah. and, and Rachel Weisz. I don't think Cheetah looks like a really great villain. I don't really know what they're doing with um, the uh, Pedro Pascal character. I don't love Chris uh, Pine coming back because I know it's just like a conjuring of like the villain can give you whatever you want. So it's just like a, a projection of her of her want for him kind of thing. Like a lot of things seem to be answered with Wonder Woman 1984. Sure. Interesting. So I, I like you just I, sold me on Black Widow. I'm a yeah, little more and, intrigued on what's going like on I in the Marvel Universe. Before. But I think there's good stuff going on in there. Are you intrigued on the Marvel Universe because it's the MCU and they're just gen generally they do deliver uh, extremely well made yeah, films? Yeah, sure, that and I, factors and I, into it. But I think that, you know, with Wonder Woman, Patty did such a great job with the first one. That that's that's my level of intrigue for the second yeah. one is, is what she did on the first movie. And it's like nothing in the Wonder Woman promos so far has really excited me. I, I completely agree with you. I think this, the trailers have been that. Now, that being said, I when I saw Tenet. Uh, recently there was a, a Black Widow trailer that played on the IMAX screen and it was awesome. Um, a new trailer? And, 
I mean, it wasn't new, but it was the newest one of the trailers, yeah. and I hadn't seen it on the big screen. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, it's it's so interesting because like now I'm even like going back in my mind now. I'm like, hmm. I Listen, which... I feel like yeah. Wonder Woman 1984 could end up being fantastic, but I feel yeah. like the only thing they brought to the table is, hey, it's this character in the 80s. Like, isn't that going to be but, fun? And with Black Widow, I, I almost think with Marvel, they are anticipating everybody saying like. Oh, this is just a prequel for a character we already not we already right. know who died. So they're gonna bring extra stuff to the table to be like, no, it's not just a prequel. It's still a really interesting, you know, MCU movie. And so I mean, listen, listen Feige's involved. I'm all in to see sure. what's gonna happen with it. Yeah. I mean, there's no question. I need and to tr- it's to kick off a of phase four, so they kind of have to like yeah. this is setting the tone for like post. But, Iron Man, Marvel, you yeah. know, you, like this is that they really have to. It have was to going to be the running. May release. It was going to yeah. launch the summer, you know, but back you, when everything was normal. So do you guys see what I mean, though? Like we, we, we've discussed this a lot over the past six months. There there are certain films that just seem like they were destined to go to VOD if they had to. Black sure. Widow, I feel like falls in the middle where I feel like it's a movie that needs to be seen on the big screen, but it doesn't feel as important as. Avengers or, you know, yeah. uh, you know what I mean? There's something well, about like, like when King like of Staten a, Island went to VOD, we were all like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But even but, even to a degree, Mulan was sort of like, well, yeah, like that, we know what happens. Like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it, but do you see how we're pushing the goal line a little bit? More? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, that's a bit, that's the last right. six months. Every like, month we it, push it. Yeah, it's, it's like, oh, yeah. what movie Mulan? And like no. a month, we're going to we're going to all going to be like, do we really need to see Dune on yeah. the big yeah. screen? Like, Dune on wouldn't my it phone. be fine if we yeah. just watched it at home? I mean, there's a, a single book. tear yeah. will roll down Gabe's cheek. <laughs> yeah, there's a book. We know what happens. <laughs> six months ago, no chance Black Widow's going yeah. to VOD. Six yeah. months later. It's a possibility. Yeah, like, I'd watch that. That is crazy <laughs> that we have yeah. we have changed that much. But now we're we're like like Tenet says we have to look at the world in a different way. You know. All right. Well, speaking of looking at the world in a different way, I have no way to transition to this. But earlier this week, we spoke with Matthew Modine, uh, who is out promoting the 4K release of Stanley Kubrick's uh, Full Metal Jacket. And actually, this is a this was a fun thing. If you guys were keeping up with the Roblox boys, uh, we did that fun thing with Warner Brothers Home Entertainment, where we uh, live tweeted through a fantastic Kubrick documentary called A Life in Pictures. I think this is what it called, right, Gabe? It's a two hour yeah. retrospective of Stanley's two and a half hour. Work. It was it was two and a it's half. A true, it's a true tribute to a Mother Kubrick film. Some really good stuff. <laughs> I especially loved the Malcolm McDowell uh, Clockwork Orange stuff. I loved uh, Nicholson at the t- uh, like old uh, a younger Nicholson talking about his collaborations with, with uh, Kubrick. So uh, all that was really great. Go check it out. It's on Warner Brothers Home Entertainment uh, YouTube channel if you want to watch the documentary. It's still posted up there. And in the meantime, uh, here is the Real Blend interview with Matthew Modine on behalf of Full Metal Jacket. It's re- it's a real pleasure to have you on. So seriously, thank you for taking Wait, the time. They all look like they just got out of jail. Well, yeah. well, well, one of the three did. I'll let you decide which one. <laughs> um, so my, my first question is, and, and I, I hate asking generic questions about what a particular person is like, but there are so few people working in this industry that I can ask this question to and get a genuine answer. So I guess my first question is just going to be, what is Stanley Kubrick like as a person? You know, I, I'm sorry, I'm, it's not... A, a, a gratuitous plug, but the uh, the Full Metal Jacket Diary is is a is a book that I, a diary that I kept while I was making the movie, and it's the first line in the book is what was Stanley like? <laughs> um, because I I think I've been asked that question easily over three four thousand times uh, since I made this movie, and it, it's it's difficult to say what what a person is like, isn't it? You know, I mean. Uh, and, you know, if I met Stanley Kubrick today, he'd probably be a different person than the person I met when I was 20, 24 years old. Um, that I think that's, that's the magic of Stanley Kubrick, because I think that he was somebody quite different to everybody that he met and worked with, that, that depending on what, what uh, their education was, what their position was on a film, uh, what their position was in life, what they did in their lives. I think that he was a very different person to each of those people that he came across. Um, the, the, the best description I can give that, that really, I, I think, encompasses uh, uh, the, uh, the concept of who Stanley Kubrick was uh, that everyone understands because everyone's seen The Wizard of Oz is that he was kind of like the all-powerful Oz, that 
he controlled the sort of perception and image of him out in the world, you know. So those photographs that would get released of him where he was, you know, with this intense, you know, directing and his brow down and, and, and fierce, fierce, fierce looking. Um, that was the image that he wanted the world to have of him. So just like when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Cowardly Lion go to meet the all-powerful Oz, that's what they meet is this larger than life, frightening, booming voice, smoke coming out of his head, flashing lights. And then little Toto jumps out of Dorothy's hands and runs down and pulls the curtain back, revealing that it's a person manipulating that image and that it's just a, a, a nice kind of bumbling genius. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that that's, that's the guy that I got to know was the guy behind the curtain. Um, I, I, you know, I was, I was terrified when I went to meet the all powerful Stanley and then found out that he was just a nice kid from the Bronx in New York City, a tough kid uh, who'd, who'd grown up after the Second World War, you know, and, and, uh, and that had tempered him and, and gave his character a kind of uh, uh, demeanor that, that I, th I think a lot of filmmakers of his generation uh, that came from New York, whether it was Sidney Lumet or, or Harold Becker that I worked with on the movie Vision Quest, uh, Arthur Penn, that there, there, was, uh, there, was, there was something special in the water for, for that generation of young directors that came out of New York City that were tough, uh, fierce storytellers. Um, and, but, but he was, he was an incredible human being, you know, that he could, he could talk to anybody, you know, that, that, uh, and he often did, oftentimes did. It didn't, he'd be able to have a conversation with anybody on the set about anything. Matthew, I'm one of the older uh, hosts of the podcast. I remember Vision Quest when it came out and how big it was for you. And it was so funny yeah. to see you transition from that to Full Metal Jacket. It was a, a huge left turn in terms yeah. of where we thought your career was going to go at that point. Um, I'm genuinely curious now because today we have directors who they hold a certain place. And we have this conversation on the podcast often of you would go see the new Scorsese or the new Tarantino, regardless of what it is. You're going because that director is the is the brand, and it doesn't really matter yeah. what subject that they're diving into. Was that the case with Stanley Kubrick um, back when he was? Because he would transition genres with every single film, and a lot of times ended up delivering the seminal version of whatever genre it was that it took on. Did audiences just come to whatever he put out, regardless, because it was the next film that he was putting out? I think so, but uh, it, that the interesting thing about that is is how many of his films were dismissed upon the release of the film. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly 2001: A Space Odyssey at the premiere in New York City. I forget how many hundreds of people walked out of the premiere. Right. You know, and I think the kind of Rock Hudson gave Stanley a parting shot as he was leaving the theater, telling him what what garbage or what trash this film was. I I, I don't know what, exactly what the quote is, but it wasn't very nice. Right. And, uh, you know, so 2001 was a huge uh, critical and financial disaster when it, when it was released. Now it's considered one of the, I mean, if you look at almost any movie about the future with space travel and things like that, they look silly when you look at them today. When you look at 2001 and Space Odyssey, 40, 50 years after the making of the movie, the, the film still appears to be in the future. Right. And he pre-visioned and his, his, his you know, art director and the, the science people that he was working with, uh, pre-visioned iPads, they pre-visioned uh, FaceTiming, you know, all that stuff, like 50 years. I mean, how, what was 2001 when it came out? It's a long time ago. Yeah. And it yeah. still looks incredibly futuristic. So uh, good for Stanley, you know, and then, uh, uh, Barry Lyndon uh, dismissed uh, sh The Shining when it came out. People thought, you know, it's the worst horror movie ever made. That the the author of the book didn't like it. Stephen Stephen uh, King didn't uh, like the movie. Dismissed it. Said it wasn't accurate. And now it's considered one of the top five horror movies ever made. Um, well, and, and the reviews for this weren't off the charts. Great, right? Full Metal Jacket. Yeah, there were some good ones. I, I you know, uh, one of them, Stanley, he called me and he quoted it. It said, the, the first half of the film is brilliant. Then the film degenerates into a masterpiece. He said, that's good writing. <laughs>
you know, because, you know, so, so many people just uh, love the first half. And then they said that the film, the second half becomes kind of meandering, uh, unfocused Vietnam film. But uh, anybody who knows anything about the Vietnam War or has experienced uh, any kind of combat situation knows that you go through this intense training period and then you go off to Afghanistan or Iraq or, or Vietnam or whatever place that the, the, the military uh, sends you. And you're in this kind of meandering, uh, unfocused battle situation, you know, that, that it, it goes all the way back to Red Badge of Courage, where you, you know, it's, it's days and months of, of boredom surrounded by one or two minutes of intense action. Mm -hmm. You know, Matthew, I'm, I'm, you mentioned the uh, the idea of that different halves of Full Metal Jacket, and uh, I'm glad you brought up 2001. I was, I was lucky enough to see a 70 millimeter print of that recently, a couple years ago, when they brought it back out, which, which was amazing. But going back to Full Metal Jacket for a second, uh, you know, with the idea of the two halves of the film, I was just interested to know tonally how they felt to shoot. I, I read that you actually uh, shot the Vietnam stuff first. Then you went back and did the everything in the boot camp. So I'm wondering, like, tonally how those things felt to shoot. And did it feel like two different chapters, essentially, when you were making both halves? Yes. Uh, and there's actually three acts in the movie. There's the, the, the boot camp, obviously. And then it goes up to the night of the Tet Offensive, when, when, the, when the, 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 they get attacked during the night of the Tet Offensive and then fades to black and then and then we go into the next the next chapter so it's really it is three acts but it feels like two halves obviously because one is vietnam and one is boot camp and uh i mean tonally they 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 were they were intentionally so what happens for the first 17 18 years of our life we're taught to respect one another we're taught to you know not harm one another not kill another person when you have uh, uh, differences, the things that you don't agree upon. And then, you know, we, we find ourselves uh, either volunteering or being, uh, in the case of Vietnam, War, uh, drafted into the military where they have to beat out 17 or 18 years of, of, uh, of training, you know, that you've been taught to respect life. And now you have to be taught to take another person's life yeah. and, you know, to pull the trigger before they pull the trigger. And so there's all this reprogramming, reprogramming that has to happen, that the individual has to become a part of a group, of a unit, you know, to, to work together, a chain of command. And, uh, you know, that takes a tremendous amount of training and surrendering of individuality, right? Of personal, personal uh, beliefs and things to become part of a group, of a, of a core, of the Marine Corps. And... Uh, you know, so that was that was the a big part of of, uh, of of what Stanley was trying to to tell. I mean, if you, you you know if you if you think back to, I think there's a common thread in in most of Stanley Kubrick's films that if you go back to 2001: A Space Odyssey or Spartacus or uh, uh, Doctor Strangelove, Paths of Glory. Um, that there's a common thread in his films where he, that like the early man who discovers that by taking a bone, he can beat another early man uh, to death with that bone. And then the bone gets thrown into space. And I, I believe arguably one of the greatest cuts in cinematic history, the bone quickly becomes a spaceship. And uh, what, what Stanley is, is, uh, illustrating is the brevity of life, you know, that, that it is a very short time ago that we were that early man uh, and now we're, you know, traveling to the moon and, and maybe to Mars in our lifetime. Um, so he illustrated that so beautifully with that bone, but the bone is important because when we use a bone to show our power over another human being, when we use that to beat another person to death, how can we evolve as a society? How can we evolve as a civilization? How can we put humane into the concept and the idea of humanity? So in 2001, he illustrates that in, uh, in, in, in Full Metal Jacket, I, I, without saying it, without, you know, which is what a master does is teach you without, te without yeah. words, you know, that, 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 that's a really hard thing to do. Yeah. Is, is he says, 
that if we don't learn as a society to solve our problems through negotiation, through conversation, through civil discourse, we are destined to be riding the bomb like slim pickings at the end of, of, of Dr. Strangelove yeah. and setting off a nuclear holocaust. That that's, that's our, our destiny, unless we can find a way to peacefully uh, you know, solve our problems. Otherwise, we're no different, we're no better, we're no more evolved than those early men picking up a bone and beating each other to death to solve our problems and show I'm smarter than you, I'm more powerful than you. You know, and, and we resemble the, the, a kind of ignorant human being, like, I'm sorry if I'm going to offend some of your, your listeners, uh, no, no more evolved than Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I don't no. think you're offending anybody. You're not offending no, any listeners. No. But <laughs> I, I, I only want to mention one quick thing because Sean and I were discussing this before we got on the call with you about how crazy it is that you did shoot the Vietnam stuff prior to the, the boot camp stuff. And I think Sean, I think this is something Sean wanted to ask as well is the idea of what that what well, that did for you as an actor. From this shoot. perspective of just like, because then yeah. you shoot Joker in boot camp and you almost have to forget yeah. everything you know he's ha has already gone through. Yeah. Like that blows my mind that your characterization of this character who has to be so freshly scrubbed and yeah. and unaware of what he's going to get yeah. into that when I read the fact that you shot all the Vietnam stuff first, I thought that what a challenge that had to have been. Well, it happens all the time on movies. You're always yeah. shooting things. You know, you you're shoot a love scene at the beginning of the movie and then you don't even know the person that you're, you know, being intimate <laughs> with. And then you have to meet her, you know, in the, at the end of the movie right. and play, the, you know, play. So it's quite common. It, it was the hair, you know, we, we had to uh, have our heads shaved. So uh, oh, that, okay. that, was, that was why. There was a period where we oh, were kind of between and I had to wear a wig under my, under my helmet, um, mm. which was really silly because it was a, I got, the wig cost about a thousand pounds, you know, so I, at that time it was probably like $1,700. And, and I put the, the helmet on top of it and just destroyed it. Uh, <laughs> but there was, there was a moment where where we were shooting both Vietnam and, uh, and boot camp. Wow. Gotcha. Uh, we had I, to get, we, plus we had to get out of Becton Gasworks uh, because it was scheduled for, for demolition, you know, that they, 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 they leased us the, the property for a period of time. And then we, we had to, to get out of there. Yeah, it also didn't seem healthy for you guys to be in there for too long. <laughs> That was one of the most toxic places I've ever been in my life. If you if you go to the Wikipedia page for Becton Gasworks, it, it'll illustrate all of the cancerous chemicals. I mean, more than a couple dozen cancerous chemicals that were uh, in. So we'd be having a cup of tea in the morning and a pastry, and and the truck would go by. You know, one of the one of the film trucks, and all the dust would fall. And you know, because we were young and stupid, you didn't think about it. You just drank the tea and <laughs> ate the ate the pastry and didn't Jeez. think too much about the dust. Right. But there was asbestos everywhere uh, from the from the buildings. You know, that were knocked down because asbestos. You know, there was that was a miracle building material for a long time. You know, that was fireproof, and right. nobody thought about it being something that was dangerous. And uh, <laughs> you know, we didn't know about what I don't know how to, get to say it. Mesothelioma. I don't know how to say. But wow. the you shots know. looked great, man. <laughs> and isn't that what matters? Yeah, it was worth That's, it. It looks good in 4K. <laughs> and you have you seen the 4K oh, version? Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, we were sent the 4K. It's incredible. Yeah, I've seen some stills. I don't have a 4K television, but um, it's breathtaking. The stills, the stills that I've seen. That's the incredible thing about shooting on film. There is so much information. Yes. So the photographs that I took with the medium format Rolleiflex camera that are in the Full Metal Jacket diary that's free to all of your listeners right now on the if you have an iPad or if you can borrow an iPad, I, I encourage you to get it. It's an incredible experience. Uh, about the making of the film, all the stories that are in it. But when you have a negative and you go into the digital world, what you're able to pull out of that negative is extraordinary. So Leon Vitale, uh, who was Stanley Kubrick's uh, an actor and, and uh, uh, his assistant for more than four decades, he's the one that mastered this, this 4K ultra digital masterpiece. And the information that he's able to pull out of the negative, it's, it's like watching Full Metal Jacket for the first time. Yeah. There's, wow. there's so much shit in there that you've never seen before. It's awesome. Yeah, the wow. 70 millimeter print of uh, 2001 that I saw a, a couple years ago in New York was from the original master and it looked absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it was unbelievable. Yeah.
yeah, Leon did that uh, remastering too. Oh. I, I know they brought Christopher Nolan in and, yeah. you know, they just wanted, I, I, I would, you know, it was nice that Christopher Nolan wanted to go in and sit on the session, but I'm telling you, the person who was at the dials and mastering the whole thing is Leon Vitale. That's wow. amazing. We're a huge uh, filmmaking did, did podcast. You, did, yeah. you guys, We're big. did you ever talk to Leon? Did you no, ever meet him? no. Uh, you should, so you did Leon um, you know. recently for a press day where it was you and Vincent and Le was Leon with you in that press day or were you with somebody yes. else? Yeah, Leon was there. Okay. I'm oh. sure uh, yeah. Someone different from Cinema Blend did that press day uh, when the three of you guys did that. So, but we just had yeah, Nolan the, on the show recently to talk yeah. Tenet. So. We're, we're we're pretty geeky film podcast. <laughs> we're big into like film, like actual. I mean, I'm a we're huge cellular guys. I mean, I've seen all of Nolan stuff on 70 millimeter IMAX. I mean, like because I because you know he really modeled his stuff after Kubrick. I mean, he loved 2001 and all that, all that, so those movies. So, uh, I, I know, but he cut my death scene out of uh, Dark Knight, and it was because he said it was so violent that it would have got a NC-17 rating. Wait, Wait what was the, the death, death scene? scene? Please tell us. <laughs> tell, us what, uh, tell us what your death scene was. So I, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. Marion Cotillard. Uh, Cotillard. 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 Yeah. Cotillard. Yeah. Uh, after she, yeah, after Bane dies and Batman, get, Chris gets stabbed, she gets in one of those, you know, those vehicles. Oh, yeah, yeah. And starts to drive away and I'm shooting at her and I got run over. All it does, it just cuts and I'm on the ground dead. But it was so violent. The guy that was, that was doubling me got hit by the car. They put a plexiglass thing on the front of it. And he got hit and he, they had ropes to pull him into the air, but he went up and they dropped him from about 15 feet. And the sound of his body hitting oh. the cobblestone street in front of the New York Stock Exchange it was sickening. And I, I remember I looked at, at Christopher Nolan when we shot it and his face was white. He was like, okay, let, let's, let's move on. We got that, you know, but it was, it was like, oh my God, is that guy going to get up? Is he okay? But he said, he said that if he would have put it in the movie, it would have got an NC-17 rating. <laughs> so wow. Now oh I really want to see it. That's wow. awesome. You. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, speaking of uh, brutality, I, I do want to bring up the great uh, Arlie Ermey. And uh, I mean, just what, what an, uh, one of the all time great performances. And I'm just sort of curious from your perspective, obviously, you know, it's pretty common. Knowledge. He like he, he made up a lot of sort of the, the insults that he was sort of throwing at everybody. And he was so good and so quick, which is obviously how he ended up getting the role. Um, but I'm sort of curious what it's like to be on the receiving end of that and knowing that he's making this stuff off off the top of his head, even though he's playing a role for a film. How do you not take some of that personally? Well, it was all scripted. There, there was no improvising on really? set. Once, once he was on this, now everything was laid out and scripted. But during the auditioning of all of those background performers, Lee, Lee was the person that was auditioning them. And during that audition process, he was saying all that crazy shit. And so uh, Stanley, you know, he thought it was so funny. So he had Leon Vitale sit down and, and, and transcribe everything that Lee was saying and had Lee say more. And so the, Leon will tell you it was like 700 pages of dialogue, but I don't believe it was, it was, maybe it was one thing on 700, maybe he, there was 700 things, but I, it couldn't have been 700 pages of, of insults. That's impossible. <laughs> but, uh, so they transcribed them and then Lee performed them on the set. But, uh, you know, people would say, how did you not laugh when he was uh, when he was in your face saying those things? Let me tell you, Lee Ermey had a mouthful of rotten teeth. <laughs> he smoked cigarettes, a lot of cigarettes. He drank gallons of coffee and he was nervous about having to memorize lines and do it take after take after take. So when he got in your face and started yelling those things, you had rotten teeth, coffee, cigarettes, and nervous tension oh, coming out of his mouth. Delightful. And then because a drill instructor only yells like that probably 45 minutes, an hour a day in real life, you know, they don't yell. And so we were filming 12 to 14 hour days and Lee Ermey was doing that for at least eight hours a wow. day. So then what happened he started to lose his voice. His throat started to bleed. And uh, 
So they gave him a steroid spray to reduce the swelling in his throat and to soothe the bleeding. So then you had nervous tension, cigarettes, coffee, rotten teeth, blood, and some weird steroid spray. So you got somebody that's this close to you yelling in your face. And it was like, you know, it was horror. It was horror coming out of his mouth. Wow. I want to ask you a quick question, um, and then I'll transition to my other one. But following up on the movie, I picked up on something that I hadn't really even realized the other times I'd seen it was your John Wayne impersonation. And you, you, ah. you fall back into it a couple of times throughout the film. And I didn't know if that was just something that you did that you brought to the table or if they specifically wanted you to do that. It was, uh, it was in Gus Hasford's book okay. that, that he did it. He, and we only had it in the script the uh, one time. And I, I, I told Stanley, I, you know, there was a scene where we added uh, Adam Baldwin, the, the scene where we, I meet up with Arliss Howard, cowboy in the pagoda. And he comes in, he says, oh, you know, you, 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 uh, a ph- you're a photographer. You know, your combat correspondent, you seen any combat? I said, well, I've seen some on TV. Yeah. Uh, so what, what really happened, that what was originally scripted was when he gets in my face and starts challenging me that I took my M16 and stuck it under his chin and said, you know, I don't know if I can swear on your show. Sure, absolutely. Yes, yes. We yeah, encourage it. You know, I, I told him to fuck off. It, you know, I've got twice as many hours in country as you. And if you don't back up, I'm going to blow your fucking head off. Yeah. And so we shot it, you know, I don't know, 15 or 20 times. And Stanley said, you know, it's not really working. He said, let's go in the trailer and talk. So I'd go to Stanley's Winnebago and he'd make some coffee and we'd start talking. He said, so where did you grow up? I said, well, I was born in California. I grew up in Utah. My dad was a drive-in theater manager. He said, yeah, yeah, that's right. He said, so what would you do? You know, you're in Utah and a big guy like Adam Baldwin comes up and he starts, uh, you know, talking shit to you. What would you do? I say, a guy like uh, Adam Baldwin? I said, I'd make a joke. What? You'd make a joke? I said, yeah, I'm not scared of guys like Adam Baldwin. I'm scared of guys like Arliss Howard, cowboy. It's the little guys that'll kick your ass. The little guys, you know, when you're wrestling like in Vision Quest, um, I don't know. I, I know that Sean saw it. I don't know if Jack. Jake, oh, yeah. But uh, it, the guys that kick your ass are the, you know, smaller, compressed, smaller muscles, faster, you know, more dangerous. Uh, you see it in the NFL today. Like the, the best athletes on the football field today sometimes are 5'10. Yeah, you know, they're right. And so a guy, so I t- say to Stan, I say, a guy like Adam Baldwin, I'd make a joke. He said, Really? You'd make a joke? I said, Yeah, I'm not afraid of guys like that. And so he said, oh, okay, uh, I, I, what are we going to do? And I said, well, I, I, and we opened Gus Hasford's book and we found this, this uh, only after you eat the peanuts out of my shit, John Wayne line. And I said, I'd love to get that in the movie. I'd love to have another John Wayne line in the movie to support the one that I said at the beginning. And so we sat in the trailer and, uh, and put that scene together uh, in Stanley Kubrick's trailer with a little uh, hand typewriter. Oh, that's you know, little, awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. so great. Wow. Yeah. You know, Mr. Modine, um, this is something I'm, I'm going to bring up now because you, we talk, we're talking about Christopher Nolan and I, I, I'm very interested to know because over the years, like there have been so many filmmakers who have changed the way we immerse ourselves in cinemas. Um, Kubrick, obviously 2001 and then, 2001 was a film that obviously birthed Christopher Nolan in regards to his love of cinema. And then now it's, you look at what he's made based on what he watched growing up. You've had the chance to work with both of them, Stanley Kubrick and Christopher Nolan. And I'm just interested to know from your perspective, like what you saw in Nolan that you might have also seen in Kubrick at that point in your career when you made Full Metal Jacket, because I know Nolan's such a big fan of Kubrick, and I know he really, really loved his films. And I'm just wondering if you saw similarities between the two since you got to work with both on their sets. Uh, not really, not any similarities I- I- at all. And um, you know, people ask me that a lot about uh, is is Christopher Nolan the new Stanley Kubrick? And I said I don't think that Christopher Nolan's trying to be the new Stanley Kubrick. I think he's trying to be the next Christopher Nolan. You know mm-hmm. that, that that Stanley wasn't trying to be anybody else. And the the, the brilliant thing that Stanley did was was you know, having moved from New York and then spent time in Los Angeles and then in eventually ending up in England was that it gave him a, a safe distance from uh, outside influence. And, you know, one of the things I talk about in my diary is the importance of 
of being, to, to learn to be, uh, uh, that, that it, it's, it's the most important uh, journey for an artist is to find your own voice, to find your own way. Um, uh, and, and so many artists talk about that in different ways. Poets write about it, you know, the, about the path less taken, least taken, um, that we all have to find our own way. That it would be, how silly of it would be if I tried to act like Jack Nicholson or Marlon Brando or Robert De Niro or Al Pacino. And the thing that each of those people that I just mentioned have in common is that they're unique because they're not trying to be somebody else. So it would be foolish for Stanley Kubrick to have, you know, you can be inspired by other director's work and other cinematographers and, and the art direction or the music that, 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 a, that a director puts into a film or the team that he assembles on the film. But you have to find your own way. And, and I think that that's what Christopher Nolan, if they, if they have something in common, Christopher Nolan is trying to find his own way, his own path, uh, just as, Alan Parker found his own path, who, who I worked with on Birdie, or, or Robert Altman uh, was continually trying to find his own way of, of telling stories and a kind of improvisational, I, I think that he was the most like a, a jazz musician of directors that I worked with, you know, the, the way that he cast his films, the way that he directed actors on the film. Um, so, uh, you know, what Stanley found a way to do was to be one of the most efficient producers that I've ever had the pleasure of working with. There were times on our set that there wasn't more than uh, 10 or 15 people on the set. And, uh, you know, that's just really smart because the less people are there, the less people you have to feed, the faster you can move from one location to another, that you can abandon something that you planned on shooting that day because, you, it, it's not working, it's not, the light's not right, the situations are not right, the actors don't, uh, are misinterpreting the, the scene. Let's go shoot something else. Let's, let's try to accomplish something else that day. So to be able to have that kind of freedom, uh, that's, that's what Kubrick uh, what created. He created a kind of uh, his own studio system in order to be able to find his own voice and tell his own stories. Mr. Modine, we're running out of time. Uh, we want to wrap on this last question because now at this point, you know, everyone is so intimately familiar with uh, Full Metal Jacket, but I need to know what you remember about the reactions in the crowds, early crowds at the premiere uh, to Private Pyle's fate um, because, you know, it, it's seminal to us now, but it had to be an incredibly shocking moment to audiences when Stanley first rolled that out. I think it is. And, and the other thing that's most important in that scene is that uh, when he shoots and kills Arlie Ermey, the, the drill instructor, that there's no joy in it. That, that in another film director's hands, they, have, they may have demonized the drill instructor for what he was doing, but somehow we understand that the situation that those recruits are in, uh, the, the, the training that he's giving them, is the only purpose is for them to save their li their own lives to be to to be killers so that they don't get killed in action you know that 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 responsibility of those soldiers that i i, I think that lee ermy understood that and and he brought that to that portrayal and stanley by not commenting on on you know by by demonizing the character but just allowing the character to to be as truthful to the to the job of what a drill instructor is is a testament to Stanley Kubrick and and also Lee Ermey that nobody felt any joy in that character's death that that it, it's just a horrible situation and it's it's terrible that that Vince D'Onofrio's character took his own life and it was terrible that he took somebody out with him when he was when he was going to do that 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 this process of, of teaching people to be killers is a very dangerous thing. And that, uh, you know, the, the, the concept that we didn't, we didn't have those words when we made the film, post-traumatic stress, it, uh, that that's something that we understand today. And, and you know, I, I wish that we could do more for our veterans. Where I'm at right now in Venice, uh, the, the streets are filled with homeless people. And I know that probably at least a quarter of those people are, are veterans that have served in and uh, you know, all the way back to Vietnam to, to uh, the, the current situation in Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, the Middle East. So uh, you know, 
God bless those those uh, men and women that served. And uh, you know, sometimes we don't see the scars of war. You know, we you know we recognize it with people who've lost their limbs or uh, you know or been disfigured or been burned. Uh, but we uh, dismiss the scars that exist inside their mind. And uh, that's an important thing about what happens to uh, Private Joker when he takes that young girl's uh, yeah. life. That what I tried to do in that moment when he pulls the trigger was to, they often, you've often heard this expression, uh, a thousand yard stare, um, that, that I that you've seen something that you can never come back from and it, and it, you, you, you never return from, from that experience that, that you had when you were in a combat situation. And what I tried to do was uh, splash blood on the audience so that they would feel the responsibility of sending people to combat situations and, and, and the, the, the things that those men and women experience are, are, are all of our responsibility, uh, you know, at home, that they're, those people, those individuals, we have a responsibility to take care of them. And, and we too, too often don't. No, I think the fact that we're still talking about this film so many years after you guys worked on it shows that you guys succeeded uh, in getting that point across. So yeah. well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Modine. It's an absolute thank pleasure you. to have you on Real Blend. And uh, we'd love to have you back anytime. Thank you so much. Thank pleasure. you. Yeah. Pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. I want to thank Matthew Modine for joining us on the show this week and make sure you pick up that 4K copy of Full Metal Jacket. Uh, I loved all the stories that he told us and that. There was really interesting stuff about working with Stanley, um, except for, you know, when you asked him that hacky question about what is Kubrick like in real life? Jeez, God. How, how dare I yeah. ask such do a some, question? Do some prep, for God's sake. <laughs> I should have read the book. Um, I would have known. Part of the reason why we are talking so heavily about Black Widow and whether it should come to theaters is because um, the Marvel machine, and it is a machine, um, is rolling along with uh, some planned narratives. And certain things have to drop before other things drop because they set certain things up. And yes, Black Widow is a prequel, but if Black Widow doesn't open for another six months, it's pushing back everything in terms of Eternals and Shang-Chi and Falcon and the Winter Soldier and this other show, uh, show that we're going to get before the year is up, although I don't know if it's November or December. Uh, conflicting reports on that one, and that is WandaVision. Um, I know a lot about WandaVision. Uh, I read the Tom King miniseries that it's based on. I'm curious about you guys. Um, did you read the Tom King series uh, no. And and are you perplexed about what's happening in this trailer? Because it is pretty out of left field if you don't know what's going on. My full uh, intrigue comes in the trailer. Like yeah. I had absolutely zero. I I had zero motivation to watch WandaVision. Just got in the sense of like when they announced the Disney Plus slate, I was like, OK, Falcon Winter Soldier sounds really cool. I, you know, I love Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen in the MCU, but mm -hmm. I, I wasn't in my mind ready to jump into a series on those two characters. The trailer completely shifted that for me. I, I mean, it looks awesome. I love the retro style of it. I don't know anything about it. I don't know what why we're seeing things in like 50s style black and white television. But um, then also there are quick flashes and it looks like they're on the set of Roseanne. It looks right, like they're in like different yeah, sort of like yeah. sitcoms like the Brady Bunch. Like so yeah. so Sean like what is the actual like what is the bit? <laughs> is it a, is it television based? Is that why it's called WandaVision? Well, um okay, so I'll I'll tell you what I think is happening in this one, but I don't want to go too deep into it because I, I don't want to give stuff away for people who have no idea, but I'm I have no idea. So this is ta you're talking to somebody who has absolutely no concept of what this story okay, is. Well, let me tell you what Tom King did, and then I'll tell you what I think they're doing for the MCU. OK, Tom, Tom King wrote a story where Vision and Scarlet Witch decided that they were going to give themselves an escape from their superhero life. Vision was still a member of the Avengers. He would have to go off on um, world saving missions. But when he came home, he wanted them to have at the closest thing to a normal life that they possibly could. So they just established an alternate little world that they could live in that looked like Pleasantville, you know, and it was uh, she was a housewife who stayed at home. They gave themselves children, which weren't exactly children. And as the um, everybody around them started to get really curious about what this was that they set up, it really started to explore like. How normal can these people live if they're just in a suburban lifestyle? Like the neighbors would get super suspicious about like, what are they actually doing over there? 
because it was like they set up like an alternate reality and it was like how long could that facade sort of stay up as they did it and that's the dinner table scene where like like it seems like they like short circuit a little bit right in the trailer yes okay. yes um with this though what i think is happening is that wanda is so devastated by the loss of vision that she has set up this um alternate reality in her own mind kind of thing where he's alive and they're living a life and they're just doing their thing and we'll see how long that it's able to be sustained. Now, now you're referring to the loss of vision from Infinity War. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, OK, so okay. It, so I don't think what we're seeing and I could be wrong is actually vision because that means they would have had to come up with some way to sort of bring him back. So it's I'm Steve Trevor. He, well, there because there's even that, that <laughs> moment in the trailer where someone says that he's dead. Correct. Catherine Hahn says, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, you're the one who's dead kind of thing. Now, that's not saying that they can't find some way to bring him back. He's just a synthetic being. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of what we're watching is taking place in Wanda's mind. I, think. I have a question. Interesting. Yeah, because you're, you're you're the Marvel master. So uh, mm. aside from Captain Marvel, are Wanda and uh, Vision the two most powerful Avengers? Absolutely. Yeah, she is. Scarlet Witch in particular is the most powerful Avenger. You haven't okay. you like you we barely seen an untapped version at all of what she's been able to do so far. Didn't Feige maybe this was before Captain Mar- Marvel, but didn't Feige come out and say that Scarlet Witch was the most powerful character he in might the have. MCU? Yeah, he might yeah. have because she is. She's I th- there's a storyline too that they do called um, the House of M, where again it's like her powers just completely go unleashed, and it takes. Everybody in the Marvel Universe having to sort of band together to stop her because she's as she's as powerful as they come. You know what I think, uh, you know, now that I'm looking back on the MCU and one thing I I think the the concern I had with uh, Avengers Endgame going into it was, are they just going to let Captain Marvel save everybody after 23 Mm. films? Like in in the sense of like, you're going to bring a new character into the world of the MCU and that's going to be the 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 end all be all that this character just ends up saving everybody after 22 films. Yeah. And I thought that the Russos handled it perfectly because they let they they Captain Marvel is so powerful that when you watch her in Avengers Endgame, she could easily just, you know, end everything in two seconds. But they handle her power perfectly. And the reason I bring that up is because I feel like they do the same thing with Scarlet Witch. Like, you know, the character is so powerful but they do a good job of like not giving you that easy out of, oh, she could just take care of everything in two seconds. Yep. And I think they find a way dramatically, especially emotionally with Wanda and Vision specifically to make it believable that her powers would be not suppressed, but she wouldn't go to the full force. Like cause when Captain Marvel comes in and destroys that ship at the end of Endgame, that was <coughs> awesome. Like that, like they they the Russos used her perfectly and like they didn't you know that's the concern i have is like are they gonna are all the avengers gonna have to basically you know essentially lose until captain marvel shows up and i think it's cool how they handle that so i've always wanted to give the mcu credit for that they they, you know how hard that is to balance all their powers and make it and make it believable and make it grounded enough where we you know that's i'll back you up i'll back you up two steps further because i watch endgame once a week the reason why that happens is because Scarlet Witch is taking Thanos down. Right. Thanos is actually losing and he he calls in the rain fire. Yep. Which means every gun points down and, and the Thanos' minion actually says, like, what about all of our troops? And he's like, right. I don't care. Decimate everybody. Like this Scarlet Witch is killing me here. I'm I'm losing to this powerful yeah. being. And so they start shooting at everybody, and it looks like the the Marvel heroes are going to be overwhelmed until the Russos figure out, point all the guns up at the sky. And I'll never yeah. forget, like, in the middle of that, the geekiest of geeky celebrations of seeing everybody doing all this stuff, when they start firing into the sky, and Tony says, uh, Friday, what is that? I grabbed PJ, because he was <laughs> next to me in, in the seat in Atlanta, and I said, oh my god, it's Captain Marvel. Like, yeah. I don't really even care that much about Captain Marvel. Exactly. But it was it, such a moment. It was yeah. such a moment. And that to me is the key to storytelling is when you're dealing with that many powerful characters. Yeah. If you can balance them the way that Russo's did and give everybody their fair shot and make it as grounded as possible. Like that, that I think that was the big concern going into Endgame and they handled Captain Marvel perfect. Now, you know what movie actually kind of delved into uh, Scarlet Witch's powers a little more than I than I remember was Age of Ultron. Her and Quicksilver. Yeah. You got a little bit more of their of their story, even though I don't really love Ultron. 
But I, I don't think people forget how powerful Scarlet Witch is. That's why I brought that up. I don't think people realize how powerful she is. We shall see. Jakey, you yeah. haven't weighed in on this at all yet, have you? <laughs> have on, you? on the Sorry. geek out session of Endgame? What do you want me to <laughs> say? No, WandaVision. Did you talk about WandaVision? No, no it looks fascinating. Um, I'm, I'm super into it. Um, and I also kind of wonder, like, but I, I guess my, my thought is if it's flexible in its release date in that it could, like, it was supposed to come out before, or yeah, it was supposed to come out after Black Widow. And if Black Widow doesn't end up coming out this year, right. does that mean that it has? There's no implications with Black Widow to WandaVision. Like they're not connected. Like where if, oh, if, the, okay. if the release dates are interchangeable, then one has no impact on the other. So I don't think that Black Widow impacts WandaVision at all um, okay. because it's a prequel. In the it way would that make it sense. Goes. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> I don't even think WandaVision um, has any tie-in to the Eternals, which would be the next one coming after. Okay. It. I think the Eternals really is trying to establish its own thing, like Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah. Um, the one movie that I know that WandaVision does have a connection to is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of the Madness, multiverse, yeah. which right now isn't coming out until March 25th of 2022. Have they even started shooting? Uh, no, they have not. And Sam, Sam Raimi's Raimi. directing that now. Yeah. Yes. That I'm very excited is, about that. That is the <laughs> only director that I would be comfortable with taking yeah. over Scott Derrickson's chair. I mean, that totally is the agree. only... I think Doctor Strange might be one of the most underrated films in the MCU. Like that. Do you guys remember the shot... When he wakes up after the surgery, it's just his hands like in front oh, of him, yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. like, and he's like, and he's like, it's this weird vision of him like picking up his. Like, that shot is epic. I love that movie. I think, but I guess like, to, like to your point though, like that's, and I don't get me wrong, I like Doctor Strange, but it's middle tier MCU for me because I think it's a really well made, beautifully shot, gorgeously envisioned psychedelic remake of Iron Man. Like it, it just sort I mean, of feels like the, the I, like it, kind of, to me it hits a lot of the same beats as Iron Man, but like if he if you took shrooms before you watched Iron Man, dude, that that scene when he's jumping around the universe might be one of the coolest like effects I've ever. I mean, it's such a well done. All right, so I'll, I'll, I know Gabe wants us to move on, so I'll just end on this exact question. It is September twenty second. Will we see Black Widow on Disney Plus before the end of the year? Yes. Yes. Wow. I, I think they're going to do like a holiday release. I, yeah. I, I, I think they're going to have to. I, I think they're going to pull a Hamilton here. Right. So Hamilton was supposed to come out in theaters next the year. The musical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The musical. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think, what, did, what did I do? <laughs> think about think about what Hamilton did for Disney Plus. All right. Yeah. If you think about what that did for numbers, subscriptions, money, I mean, right now, Disney isn't now. I guess this goes into this other question, though, right? Because we all know the, that there's so many deals happening outside of the movies that we don't even know about, like IMAX and Dolby and all these contracts and back end deals on box office. Do you think Black Widow could supersede that? Because, I mean, what Black Widow would hands down be the biggest film to make that move. Yeah, no there's, no, there's not yeah. even it's not even. But close. also keep in mind the the thing that, that keeps getting brought up that I feel like people aren't really talking about is that even if these movies make less, Disney gets to keep a hundred every yeah. dollar. <laughs> exactly. Like oh, yeah. like like you know even if like you know even if it only makes a hundred million dollars, that's a hundred million dollars of pure profit. So mm -hmm. so I mean, what is that equitable to mm -hmm. at, in a normal world's box office? Is that like two hundred yeah. million? Like I don't know how much. These studios have to give to the theaters. It's hard to calculate because it's it's um it's it's run out time based. So yeah. like the first couple of weeks, I think the studios get the bulk of it, yeah. and then after it depends. I think it's I'm sure there's different deals for different yeah. studios. But, I don't know how that works, but it's it after a few weeks, then the theaters start yeah. getting like, like every number these days. I feel like needs to be taken yes in the content and, and the same thing. Yeah. Like we're talking about Tenet. Like we're talking about a movie that's about to cross potentially three hundred million dollars worldwide. In the middle of a, of a freaking pandemic, like everything should be addressed, not how we would have addressed it a year ago, but we need to address it within the context of what's happening in this world today. I actually yeah. think, and this is coming from somebody who wants to see Black Widow in a theater. I think that that would be one of the most one of the smartest financial decisions Disney could make is putting Black Widow in Disney Plus. Like, I, I, it would make so much money. It's PG-13. Yep, it's a Marvel film. Yeah. everybody's home people would pay sixty dollars to watch black widow like like you just said they would to your point to your point uh, if, uh, let's not do sixty dollars but, but Sean to your Lloyd, point and then said, we'll, to your point and then we'll move on though um you know we're leaving the summer season which is a huge movie season right that's getting elongated every year but we have two points um that are major 
for the general audience, which is Thanksgiving and Christmas. So yeah. Families go, you know, a oh, Thanksgiving, they could release Thanksgiving release would yes. yeah. destroy. Yeah. yeah absolutely well, right. think about how many families, you know, families that see three movies a year. Yeah. Two of those are usually Thanksgiving yeah. and or Christmas. Yeah. Like, you know? yeah. like it's at this and point, I feel like they time. need to drive home. You know, whenever people whenever I talk about the th- the thirty dollar mark, people always go thirty dollars, thirty dollars. And I go, no, because if everyone in this room went to the movies at this moment, it would be fifty dollars or sixty dollars. Yeah. And then everyone in the room normally goes. Oh yeah, you're right. I guess I feel like they need to find a way to like kind of push that into their promotion. It's basically yeah. say like yes, yeah, like thirty dollars cheaper than bringing a family to the movies because mm-hmm. like it really it like it on the surface it sounds a lot, but when, oh when you're God. talking about a Black family, Black Widow for Black Friday, you just you put it Black Widow out on Black Friday, dude. And you crush. I'm, right, Sean, right, right now Disney Plus is just. Sean, you you're, yeah. you're starting to convince me, man. I, I feel like, and again, right. I want to see it in theaters, but I have a hard time believing they wouldn't do that. Right, <laughs> I, just don't to. I, just, I just don't understand why if you're a business, if it's a business. Let's get to a, a movie that we are expecting to be talking about throughout the course of the award season, which is Supernova. Uh, it dropped its trailer this week. Uh, Jakey, I want you to jump to that one first. It's Colin Firth. <laughs> And uh, Stanley Tucci together. Yeah, uh, I, it's so great whenever you can experience because it so rarely happens these days. But experience a trailer knowing absolutely nothing about the movie. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I didn't know what this movie was. Gabe just sent the trailer over and said, that, "Like, hey, let's watch this and talk about it before the show." And at first, I pressed play and I thought, "Like, oh, like I, I love Colin. I love Stanley. Like, this is a great." And by the end of the trailer, I like my heart was just like, "Yeah." In in two and a half minutes, the emotions they made me feel and and. You know, I, you know, it's always so interesting whenever they, um, you know, they, they obviously Colin Firth is Academy Award winner and Tucci is Academy Award nominee. You know, if we're, if we're, if we're living in a world where Tucci wins an Oscar, I ain't going to be mad about it. No, no. Um, but, uh, you know, cause I think he got nominated once before for Lovely Bones, which he was the only good thing about that movie. Um, but, uh, I, that, that movie looks incredible. The two of them look fantastic. It, it, I have a feeling it's just going to destroy me. But uh, I, I am in 100% beautiful trailer and, and what looks to be like a beautiful on-screen relationship between the two of them. It reminded uh, me of a movie we, that came out recently that I forget the name of that had Alfred Molina and um, wasn't John Malkovich, was it? Who are the two of them played a couple uh, that were going that were older? God, I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I mean, this, seeing the two of them together on screen is yeah. beautiful, looks fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I agree that... Yeah. It's just heading into this season, it's going to be so interesting to see how movies play, who gets pushed. Um, we were going to, we're going to talk about later the trial of Chicago 7, and uh, one of the people on our staff, uh, Jeff McCobb, is an enormous Sorkin fan, a diehard Sorkin fan. And immediately he was like, can Sasha get nominated? Sasha Baron Cohen for playing Abby Hoffman. And I yep. was like, ah, look, everyone, there's Are a lot they... of people who are eligible, but I don't yeah, even know who's sure. going to get pushed kind of thing. So, I mean, there um, has to be, that's the thing, there has to be a meeting, where, especially for a movie like that, not to go too far into the weeds on Chicago 7, but we're talking an incredible cast that does amazing, like, at some point, Netflix has to sit down and basically go, who's our best shot? Because yeah. we can't put all of them out there. Right. It's the same reason Watchmen, lo- I think, the reason Watchmen lost Best Director at the Emmys, because they had three episodes that were nominated, so they all split the vote. So, yeah. you know, I, 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 I think at some point they have to sit down and they go, who's our best shot at getting a nomination? Okay. I, I, I mean, is anyone really actor in that movie in Chicago 7? Eddie Redmayne. No. I mean, and, also they're, I, and, and I think they're, they're all the eggs uh, for the best actor Netflix basket are, I think, going toward Del Roy Lindo. Redmayne's Red Red the lead. For yeah, seven. I think so. sure. Yeah, I think he gets. Yeah, stuck. but I, mean, right. I think Netflix. I mean, Netflix doesn't want to compete against itself, so I think they'd rather push Delroy and then find someone that they could push for a supporting actor. Kev, what are your thoughts on the Supernova trailer? Well, the only again, this is completely off topic of Supernova, but speaking of Stanley Tucci, underrated Tucci performance, Easy A. I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know why. Oh, it's great. I, I just love. Oh, him wow, what's his line about like <laughs> you look like a, like a hooker, but like a high class one, like for prostitutes. <laughs> That movie <laughs> is like for, so for politicians. good. No, no, I'm, I listen, I think it looks great. I, I love Colin Firth, love Stanley Tucci. I mean, it's one of those things where, like, Stanley Tucci is, I, I would argue, a very underrated actor. Sure. Um, you know, he's such a great actor, but I don't feel like he's talked about enough. Yeah. I mean, Colin Firth, you know, winning for King's yeah. Speech kind of, like, elevated his name clearly. But, you know, those two actors together, yeah. you know, th- there's something to be said about two brilliant performers sharing screen together. 
mm. you know, and just chewing scenery and just having dialogue together. And you, I, I never, I, they've never done a movie together before, right? No, the, but uh, I think they're really good friends in real life. I didn't, so, yeah. yeah, I didn't. I, they yeah. look like they've been acting together for years, just yeah. based on the trailer. I mean, Tucci again, is. I was going to say, Tucci's kind of the, 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 the shoulders that other actors stand on, yes. I feel like. You know, in, in so many great movies, he's so great as like in a secondary, you, you, even to, to something like uh, Devil Wears Prada. Mm-hmm. He's fantastic great. in Devil Wears Prada, but he just he's gets, setting everybody up. He's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's, he's it, the setup for everybody else. It's the same thing for EZA, thinking about Patricia Clarkson. Sure. Yeah, like I think Clarkson and Tucci are in the same boat. Like they're both like very good supporting actors yeah. who who are leaned on by the leading cast, but the leading cast is made better. Like Emma Stone's performance in EZA is better because of Tucci and mm. Clarkson. Yeah, I think that's what Jake's saying. Yeah, I always think to that. But I always think that that's the secret to Stanley Tucci is he's like he's a lead acting talent and presence, but he does character work. Mm-hmm. Mm. Like he he puts all the lead acting talent yeah. and presence. Yeah. And energy that you would expect from someone to, who's going to carry a movie, yeah. But he gets to do it in these like small, really yeah. punched up roles. And he, I, I love Stanley. He's Tucci. kind of in the shadows in a weird way, like yeah. like Tucci kind of just like he sh- he shows up, he does his thing, he's brilliant, and then he probably just lives a normal life. And I, I, mean, I don't think he's like super famous. I don't think people would stop him too much. What about saw- him in the What about him in the Hunger Game movies? He's <laughs> great he's, in the Hunger Games movies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The host of that talk. He's, show. he's great in Road to Perdition. Is Tucci. he in Road to Perdition? Yeah. You're kidding me. He plays Tucci. Frank Nitti. Tucci's great in Hunger Games. That's right. He's so, like, doesn't yeah. he do like that awkward TV interview with them in the first yeah, yeah, one? Yeah. He's like some yeah. artificial TV he, uh, host. He's, he's basically <laughs> like the future's version of Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. Right. He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's really good. He's Wait, a really, what is the, There's an SNL skit about Tucci, isn't there? Like a digital short, Tucci Gang? Why do I seem to remember a digital there, short yes, about this? Yeah, that's a Pete Davidson a like rap, <laughs> rap video. Yeah, there, about how great Tucci is. <laughs> yeah. There was Tucci a gang. bit recently. Didn't he go viral recently for some drink he made? He made oh, some. Yeah, drink. he did yeah. like a. Yeah, yeah, he did it yes. at uh, the beginning. God, remember remember the beginning of the quarantine where <laughs> when we just all made fun videos. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we all we weren't all crawling out of a pit of despair. Anyway, keep an eye out for Supernova because I again <sighs> again assume we're going to be talking about this for uh, a couple of weeks. Uh, I want to get to the Emmys. Um, you two are a lot more into the Emmys and the shows that won and the presentation itself. In fact, I wasn't able to watch any of it so the big one was at the we were, sh- we were literally in a show called awards blend what do you mean you weren't able to watch it i didn't watch the emmys we i had something no one on watched Sunday the emmys night. it was the yeah, lowest rated emmys yeah. ever six million people watched the emmys which but is I, I, so shit's creek good. swept but i want you guys to talk about the presentation of the show in a pandemic the little bits that i saw that was so everybody sort of did their award speeches from their homes or wherever mm-hmm. they were set up is that how it mm-hmm. worked out Oh, by the way, you mentioned Shit's Creek. I want to bring yeah. up something I mentioned to you guys. Jake, didn't I have that question to mm-hmm. you guys a while back about whether or not we could say Shit's Creek on the air? Yeah. Did you notice? But, but I, th- I think Jimmy Kimmel's thing was a bit because every no, no because every newscast says Shit's Creek. The Today Show st- said S Creek, NPR, and uh, radio stations here where they I live did? said S. Cre- yes, I'm not we, kidding We said you. Shit's Creek over. Not only did we say Shit's Creek, like like we joked about the fact that what of the, like what shits sound like. No, like we. we but, 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 but wait, Jake, wait, to Jake's point, though, I want to mention, if you didn't see the Emmys, I want to mention this. When when Kimmel said Shit's Creek on the air, ABC. Now, it could have been a joke. I don't I don't think it was a joke, to be honest. They made him put up a Chiron that said the title of Shit's Creek. It was the logo every time he said it because they were worried that people were going to think he was saying the S word. Like, I mean, every time he said Shit's Creek, it, it popped I think up that was screen. a bit. I think that was a bit. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I think, I think that was, that was a bit a, because even like the newscast that followed the Emmys would say like Shit's Creek swept the Emmys. Da, 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 like like, but the, at six in the morning, the next morning on Monday morning at my station, we were in my newsroom having genuine discussions about whether or not we could say it and like limiting it and like I, 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 it, we, we had. I, I I feel like if it were like a legit like we would it would be a blanket. Now it's one thing if like if different stations are having discussions about whether or not they want to do it. But if it were a serious like FCC violation, it would be a blanket statement across the nation that all all stations would know but about there, and we would all hear. There about was it. a tweet that they had um, from a good place and it yes. said, Shirts. I want to congratulate Shirts Creek. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, why can't wait, I say Shirts yeah. Creek? <laughs> that's a great. That was a great uh, all right, bit. so Watchmen wins big also. Uh, it gets best limited series. Regina King continues to dominate. Uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen 
wins it wins writing i mean all deserved right yeah that did was... you guys see one of my favorite bits out of because you were talking about the presentation and it was this whole idea of all the nominees were at home and you know whenever it came time for someone's category there would be a person in a hazmat suit waiting outside their door holding an emmy and if you won you got a knock and then you know and my my big question was okay does every nominee really have someone waiting outside or do they only send someone to the person that's going to win yeah and then rami Rami Youssef, Youssef? Yeah. Yeah. It's posted an amazing tweet, which is actually my favorite thing to come out of the Emmys. Mm-hmm. And the tweet, I think the tweet was captioned, what happens when you lose an Emmy? And it's a guy in a hazmat suit holding an Emmy, waving as he walks away <laughs> with the Emmy that Rami lost. So really, they really did have people at every person's house holding an Emmy. And if you lost, they just walked away with it. That's See, pretty amazing. I want to question that for a second, because I, I, I am a little concerned that that was a bit. Um, and here's why. Well, they what? would have put it on the show, wouldn't they? No, no, no. My, uh, here's, here's, so Jake's- no, no, actually, I, I know why it's not a bit. Okay, go ahead. Because, okay, so you and I uh, know, now I don't say we're friends with, but you and I know um, a, a makeup artist that does the makeup and hair for a lot of the celebrities on the junkets. He does mm-hmm. Anne Hathaway's and he does a lot of people. And I think you're friends with him on Facebook and I'm friends with him on Facebook. And he, he was with... Um, one of the best actress in a comedy nominees. What's what's the um the show on Netflix? I don't know. He was with one of the nominees, and they and she lost. And they and he posted a picture of him, the actress, and the person in the hazmat suit holding the Emmy as the person was about to take it away because she lost. So they really did send people with hazmat suits to everyone. Was that person at home or in the studio? Yeah, Somebody at home. Was, okay, at home. This person was at home. So I guess my, my, my point is, so Jake's referring to something where at the beginning of the show, they did a bit with Kia where people were getting into hazmat PPE suits and driving to every nominee's house and then waiting outside their house with the Emmy to give it to them if they win. Now, during that's the show, expensive Jake, expensive bit. That's why I think it's a bit. And, here, and here's why, Jake, during the show, some of the awards were in some kind of box next to the winners that just exploded open. And then they right. and then they got their Emmy. My point being is that Rami Yusuf uh, posted this great video. It's and it's a guy in a, a, a person in a PPE uh, e outfit outside his house with the Emmy in his hand, which he lost. And why didn't we see? All the other losing uh, nominees post videos of of people outside their house besides Rami. Well, they probably didn't want to brag about the fact that they lost and someone was taking their Emmys away. <laughs> I feel like every celebrity. Well, I, well I've now jumped. seen it twice. I've seen it. I've seen it twice from two different people. Right. So now, granted, maybe they didn't do it to like all the people, like maybe like not the writers, or maybe like yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah. know, like, actors. I would imagine. Yeah, maybe, maybe they did it for the actor, and maybe they. Well, I don't know. Even like uh, the people in, uh, it's for Succession were in london and they had an emmy waiting for them so like like the schitt's creek uh group was all in one place you guys saw yeah. that right yeah. they were like a, yeah. they were in like a restaurant yeah. and they had a microphone and they all got up and they won seven in a row yeah. um they were in canada that made sense I, yeah. I just have a hard time believing that every nominee had a person outside um, their house in a ppe outfit with an emmy in their hand i just have I a wanna, hard time believing that i want to ask you guys about zendaya um because you both watch euphoria mm-hmm. did you both watch it yeah, I have not seen you for it. You've not seen, seen it? it? Yeah. Okay, I thought you watched it. Jake, she deserved? Deserved uh, to win? It's, it's, an, it's absolutely, it's an amazing performance. And honestly, of all the, of all the, the women that were nominated, yeah, I'd probably vote for her. Yeah. Um, the only other person that I maybe might vote for, I mean, and the thing is, is I know so many people had Jennifer Aniston winning, and she's good in the morning show, but like, I mean, you. I mean, there are there are some moments that. I mean, I think by the time we got to best act, they were trying to blow through the show, so they cut out all the clips that okay. like you know normally would preface, um, you know, like Zendaya and Euphoria. I um, but this... there are. Oh, there, there were there were um a, there are so many moments that could have been like her Emmy clip from that show. She had, I I I think she deserved it. I thought there was a lot of I thought there was a lot of really great reaction to her winning by other mm-hmm. people who really yeah. seemed to be thrilled for her. But you're yeah. exactly right in the fact that I was watching someone's reaction video uh to her winning and I saw them read the nominees. And there were like nine nominees. It was like yeah, critic's yeah. choice for yeah. God's sakes. But they just kept naming people that she was up against. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, is everybody getting nominated for this? Yeah. But uh, I, I, really I, do, happy I want to shout out Yaya yeah, Abdul Mateen the second, by the way, only because like, well, first of all, and you guys know I was, I was late to the party on Watchmen, but episode eight of Watchmen, A God Walks Into A Bar is like one of the greatest episodes of television I've ever seen. To see him win that award 
made me so happy. I don't know if you guys watched the end of his speech, but one of the cool things about the Emmys the other night was while we had these live feeds in people's houses, when the speech would stop, sometimes they would still keep the feed up. And my favorite thing of the whole night was Yahya Abdul-Mateen the second, like literally not knowing his feed was still on and getting out of his chair and running and screaming to whatever family member or friend was in the house with him. And like, like that dude was so genuinely excited. First of all, I thought there was no way he wasn't going to win. After episode eight, there was that performance is just masterful. Wait, um, I thought he had a reaction video when he got his nomination, too, didn't he? Probably. Didn't he have something where I, th- I, mean, I swear there was a video where he was reading the nominees on his laptop and then he got probably. up and like ran to the people in his house. Dude, so. that guy is such a talented actor and he's great in Trial of Chicago 7. I think he's actually the best performance yeah. in that film. And I, I can't wait till pe- for people to see him in that. He's great. All right, and all we right. all spoke to him the day before he won his Emmy. Yeah. yeah. And That's by true. the way, and he said the first scene, I told you guys this, I'll just say it for the audience. The first scene he ever shot as Dr. Manhattan was the bar, was the bar scene in also, Watchmen. He's yeah. a Black Manta in Aquaman 2, and he's in yeah. Matrix 4. So he's going to be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, got, he's got a good he's career a, coming. He's a tall dude, too. Like He's a big dude. Like, like he, I think he's going to be a big action star. I really do. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, yeah. All right. I want to point, move on to the fact that um, r- right before we started recording this one, news was breaking about Hollywood unions and the studios are agreeing to their COVID protocols for restarting productions. And some of the things that they are touching on are safety guidelines surrounding safety equipment and testing sick and quarantine paid leave. And they are going to continue open discussions and develop procedures as the uh, movies resume production. So I think that's primarily in the States because when I was talking to Eddie Redmayne for Chicago uh, 7, Trials Chicago 7, he confirmed to me that Fantastic Beasts is yeah, actually I was been... Eddie Redmayne for Chicago 7. Has, uh, you, you talked to him too. <laughs> that he's been back to filming for about three weeks now and that they are doing masks and they're getting tested constantly and he was saying that he... Th- found it interesting because he was afraid that wearing masks and social distancing was going to eliminate the spark that he thinks actors need to play off of each other sort of thing. Like that was a concern of his and it hasn't been the case and they've been fine to shoot. It was, he said, he told me that they were literally, they shot like two days of pre-production filming uh, on a Friday and a Saturday. And then they got the call on Sunday night, right before they were supposed to start Monday with full launch of Fantastic Beasts 3, they got the call on Sunday night that they had to shut down and they've been shut down for the past six months. And he discussed, um, you know, how that's been to look at it. This is a weird way to say it, but it's been a benefit that they were able to step back, address some issues that, you know, they were going to face down the line, clean up the script a little bit. And uh, so I think a lot of the franchises that were racing to hit pre-announced opening dates, like a lot of times these sequels just get you're coming out on this day, whether you're ready or not. And so it's allowed them to sort of go back and, and reassume that. But I wanted to bring that up because it just now is starting to feel like Hollywood on these bigger productions is starting to figure out how to move forward. And I hope as we get into the end of this year and uh, 2021 that we start to ramp back up to production uh, and see where things are going. So uh, this week in movies, let's get to a bunch of limited releases. Uh, did anyone see Miranda Joy's film, Kajillionaire? Kajillionaire? As uh, Evan Rachel uh, Wood. Evan Rachel Wood. Evan Rachel yeah. Wood. Yes. Um, no, haven't seen it. Uh, coming to limited VOD. Misbehavior. Okay, Misbehavior is uh, a 1960s based British dramedy uh, starring Keira Knightley that I watched. And uh, Gugu Mbatha Raw and also um, Jesse Buckley. Is it Jesse? Uh, is that, is oh, that from name? I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Yes. Um, yeah, she's it, great. It's a, it's a really good topic. Um, it's about there's dueling subject matters going on with it. There's a bunch of um, protesters who are arguing essentially for women's rights in the 1960s uh, and the rise of the prominence of the push for women's rights opposed with a Miss Universe pageant that they want to hold in London. And it's how um, th- that was like at the time, one of the most popular televised productions and and how those two ideas clash with each other, you know, like that the, there's women who's fighting in the academic front to be treated uh, like equal students and that the ideas that they're bringing to the table deserve to be heard by their um, male professors and male colleagues. 
But at the same time, everyone's turning around and giving so much credence to this Miss Universe pageant where legitimately all the contenders are getting up there and they're just like, well, look how good she looks in a bathing suit or, yes, yeah, she's got pretty blonde hair. We should push her forward kind of thing. So the group led by Jesse Buckley and Kira Knightley decide that they're going to crash the Miss Universe pageant. Um, but then they get to know one of the uh, contestants known by uh, uh, played by um, Gugu Mimbatha Raw. And they learn like the reasons why she's in the pageant. And, you know, she has legitimate reasons like this is her entrance way into getting out of her her bad uh, life. And so it tackles a lot of things. The point I'm getting at is that it does it in like those safest sort of uh, a, like the best way I can describe it is like a focus features or Fox Searchlight type movie. <laughs> Um, where it's got such a polish on it, you know, that it, I was like, there's a really great way to tell this story. And I'm not quite sure that this is the way to do it. Um, so it ends up being like, just like that middle of the line where you're just like, yeah, this is pretty good. And the performances are good in it, but I know that there's a better way to tell this story. Cause it just feels a little bit safe and polished. Do you guys like, know? It would have been a junket that we, I, I feel like I know exactly what you're talking about. Like it would have been a junket we did in Toronto, but it would have been one of our like lesser tier Toronto Hot, junkets. That's the perfect way to describe it. Yes. You would have it would have been a tiff junket that you would have done on like a Sunday morning. And uh and, and the one we just needed to get through to get to like the big one. <laughs> yes, that's that's a good way to put it. So Kevin, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say that. No, I I, I know exactly what you mean. It's like I, I, I find that to be <laughs> That's such like, an inside baseball. Yeah. Way to describe a movie. It's so descriptive, yeah, I but say, I don't it was think for no one else to understand. No, no one there's else no other way to describe it though. It's perfect yeah. that nails it. It's, it's like a Saturday tiff with like nine junket schedule. You do yeah. it like at one o'clock in the afternoon and yeah. you know, you hop over to that that one hotel where you're in the crowded hallway. I know exactly what kind of movie this is. <laughs> and usually, I hate to say this, but Kira Knightley's in a lot of those. I've done a lot of those junkets. And, and I love Kira Knightley. Kira Knightley. Oh, she's the way, best. I also love that it's spelt like the favorite. Like, it's the British way of spelling this behavior. Be behavior and yes. favor. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is Ava? Gabe, what is Ava? It says limited VOD. Do you know what that is? Uh, it has Jessica, Jessica Chastain. Chastain. Yeah. Colin Farrell. It's like a, uh, there's someone else in it that's kind of big. Don't know. It looks like they put it out because it's bad. And so they're like, let's put it out now while no one's watching. <laughs> it's a good, uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> but it has a great cast. That's on the poster. <laughs> yeah. Let's put it out now while no, no one's, one's watching. watching. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Enola Holmes. Uh, Jake, I know you saw this. Kev, did you see I did. Enola Holmes? Uh, I haven't seen no. it. Jake, uh, yeah, I, uh, I was very pleasantly surprised by this movie. Um, it, uh, it tells the story of, and I did not know this, but apparently Sherlock has a sister. Uh, named Enola Holmes and her mother played by uh, uh, Helena Bottom Carter goes missing and so uh, uh, Henry Cavill and then uh, Sherlock's brother Mycroft yes Mycroft show Mycroft. up Mycroft show up and uh, to kind of like take care of her while they're uh, while their mother is missing and she kind of takes off and goes on her own adventure to, to find her mother um, I was surprised at how big I really thought Henry Cavill as Sherlock was going to kind of just be spare I'm surprised at how big of a role he has in it um, and then also I don't know if you guys have heard sort of the, the behind the scenes drama with this movie so the the um, family of, of uh, Arthur Conan Doyle who own the rights to Sherlock Holmes, they only own the rights to like 1929 and beyond. They don't own the rights to, to like 1928 and before. And 1928 and before Sherlock Holmes was a very cold, calculated, non-emotional character, which is why, and so all of those rights to adapt that Sherlock Holmes are free. Which is why so often studios will portray Sherlock as being this cold, calculated guy. And so Netflix is actually currently being sued by the family because they have portrayed Sherlock in this film as sort of an emotional caring man. And the family, the estate, says that they own the rights to that version of Sherlock. And they say that the reason that Conan started writing differently is he came back from the war and he started sort of feeling differently about, about life. And so it just really made me realize like it was a, such a fresh, interesting take on Sherlock Holmes because we haven't really seen him portrayed that way before. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, Millie Bobby Brown does the whole, like, breaking the fourth wall, direct, you know, speaking directly to us. She's so charming. It was a lot more violent. It's, it's a straight-up PG-13 film. I thought it was going to be kind of a family-friendly. Oh, yeah, it's I a, thought so, too. Yeah, it's much more, like, 
I mean, for, for more so than I mean, it's not rated R, but more so than I thought it was going to be a lot more violent. Um, and uh, it's layered and it's complicated. It's, it felt a little long. It could have been trimmed by a good 15, 20 minutes, but I was very pleasantly surprised. Did Cavill do press for it? I didn't see him do anything. He didn't do the junket that I did. I haven't, I'm surprised he didn't do much for it. Yeah. I wanted he to, might be shooting The Witcher. I wanted to, uh, uh, to shout out The Verge for having the best headline for that story that Jake was mentioning because they say, Arthur Conan Doyle's estate sues Netflix for giving Sherlock Holmes too many feelings. It's <laughs> 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 the best headline. That's awesome. Uh, was there any moment in the movie when uh, Enola's nose started to bleed because she no. was thinking too hard to solve the... No. no. It happened at the 11 minute mark. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. And people Take said, this on. is a stranger thing that's happening here. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> when they Dang, say that line, though, they, all, this entire they all look show. right at the camera when they say it. <laughs> Wait, so does Enola have a couple homes? Is that why it's called that? Like, she owns a couple, like, does she have a beach it's, house? It's and like Real estate. She works <laughs> in real estate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The whole story is she keeps buying homes where people have been killed, and so he's going to come by and solve the murder. Do they digitally put a mustache on Henry Cavill this time? Contractually, oh. they were obligated to. Oh my god, that would have been amazing if they digitally reversed it. Oh or like, like, but they put like a different one in every scene. Like when it's like really big and long. No, between shots, like they cut away to someone's reaction, they cut back, and it's all twirly. Then one time they cut to Anola, she's got like a goatee. In all, in all honesty, I do. I love Millie Bobby Brown, and I, I'll watch it because of her. She's actually somebody I, I, I like to watch uh, just in regards to like any performance she does. I think she's a really, really talented actor. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't know much about Enola Holmes until Jake described it just now. But I mean, I knew about the premise of it, but I'll watch it because she's in it. I, I, I think she's an amazing actor. Better Sherlock Holmes, Cumberbatch in the Netflix shows or Downey, Downey. Jr. in the movies? Downey. Downey. I prefer uh, I'm the gonna Downey go, version. I'm going to go Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. Downey's doing I, a Downey's version of, he's doing like a yeah, elevated. He's doing British, uh, yeah, Brit- British Tony Stark. Yeah, British yeah, Tony Stark <laughs> with a little bit of uh, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow. I like the first there. one a lot. The, the second first, one. Dude, Guy Ritchie and 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 Downey's Holmes, um, I love that movie. I thought okay. that was awesome. I, mean, no, I, was- I love the movies. I just felt Cumberbatch is better and to be honest i think i might like jude law more than i like robert downey jr in in the guy richie movies i think you're supposed I, to i think I that's what should accomplished <laughs> i don't know enough about sherlock holmes to to say which character is closer to sherlock holmes i mean no like you know this, what i i want to i'm going to admit something here i've never read a sherlock holmes story right. i feel like i should i feel like i should pull one off the shelf and just read them the only Listen, thing i know about sherlock yeah. holmes is from movies and television yeah, our perception of Sherlock Holmes is comes from this this concept of who Sherlock Holmes yeah. is in the media, well, which is why it's this this new portrayal by Henry Cavill is so like refreshing and interesting because I, it really and granted I I sort of knew the backstory going in with the whole lawsuit and everything, but it really made me realize wow I actually haven't seen Sherlock show like sympathy or or, or you know or caring to anyone. Okay, well Anola Holmes uh, coming to Netflix on Friday. Uh, this week's blend game, Tom Hardy blend, uh, which got a, re- a lot of really great responses from people on social media, and I will read those at the end of us playing the game ourselves. I'm going to start with Kev McCarthy. Kev, your favorite uh, Tom Hardy movie? I'm gonna go. I mean, I feel like the I think the best performance of his and personally is Dunkirk, but favorite. Dunkirk. Uh, see, really? I think Dun- I think Dunkirk's actually the hardest performance of his career uh, from a, from an emotional standpoint because I think because he can't use his face, it's all in his eyes the entire time. I think that performance is super understated. Interesting. Um, imagine having to act the entire time with just your eyes. It's not. It's he not an easy. Task. The Dark Knight Rises. He wears yeah. a mask well, a lot. Well, the ma- the voice in in The Dark Knight Rises is not great, but I thought Dunkirk. Um, my favorite movie he's ever been in is probably Warrior. Favorite performance okay. of his. Um, okay. only because it's just a genuine gut punch like that movie is brilliant um uh gavin o'connor directed it who directed the way back um i just guest I, of good day chicago yeah and i i I, I really wait what no huh? good day chicago <laughs> jesus what's the name of this show i'm sorry what <laughs> <laughs> hey he was on good day chicago <laughs> <laughs> but also real blend. Yes, he was on real. God, I'm so out of it, and it's yes, only Tuesday. On sorry, sorry. No, but I mean, going back to what I was saying about like, like 
my fa- I guess my favorite movie he's been in is probably Dunkirk. My favorite performance of his is definitely Warrior. I think Warrior, just only because of just him and Joel Edgerton are phenomenal together. I thought Nick Nolte was brilliant in that film. I, th- I remember crying so hard at the end of, of Warrior. Just It's an emotional, underrated performance. I remember um, just, I don't know, for some reason that film really struck me. I don't think I really expected it to be as special as it was. The MMA element of it was an interesting quality to it, but it was really about a movie about two brothers and the concept of them fighting each other and kind of working their differences out as family members through that element. Um, I just think that Hardy, I, I like Hardy in that in that type of vulnerable performance, but also that he's like, it's still a badass character, but it's just the vulnerability of the emotions between him and Edgerton, just two powerhouse actors. Um, I just remember being very emotionally moved by that performance and, and that movie. And I think Gavin O'Connor, that that movie is so underrated not a lot of people saw it in theaters that I remember. Um, it was just it just didn't do well. Warrior. I, I don't think a lot of people have seen Warrior. I mean, we've didn't, seen it. Yeah. I mean, just, uh, I had nomination, uh, one Oscar nomination, maybe two. Yeah. But did I mean, he get any? I didn't know that got uh, any. No, no, I think Nolte got nominated, didn't okay. he? Okay. Nolte is phenomenal in Warrior. Like it's yeah. a it's a great performance. But you know, I think what makes uh, that movie so great is Hardy and Edgerton. I mean, those two together, their performance is like you know, it's interesting because Hardy is such a a raw actor. Um, and I think that uh, just watching those two together, that hands down is my uh, uh, is the performance that comes to mind when I think of him outside of Christopher Nolan. Um, you know, for me, you know, you, you clearly can go Inception. He's great in Inception. He's great in I think Dunkirk was one of the most challenging performances just because he had to act all through his eyes primarily. But Warrior would be my favorite if I was going to choose that. So yeah. I'll go next because I also chose Warrior. Um, and you're you're exactly right. It's just it's I can't believe how underrated it is. I, I'm starting yeah. to feel like more and more people are figuring it out. I'm starting to feel I hear from more people who do see it. Um, if you haven't, if you're if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Warrior, for God's sakes, honestly, as soon as the show is over, yeah. just go put it on because we can't tell you enough how good it is. It'll pump you up. Like it is like it's a it's such a it's such a like a oh, it's such well, an amazing movie. I think it's really hard to do um, a true underdog inspirational sports movie because you just you, I think as an audience member, you can see through them right away. Right. Like you can just see like, I know exactly what you're trying to do. And I. Watching Warrior for the first time is what I imagine a crowd watching Rocky for the first time. That's felt. a great point. And Warrior didn't ever feel like manipulative ever. Nope. It nope. always worked. No, you're so right. I because we, we never saw Rocky that way. We ne- we always saw it later in life. It gives you. It, yeah. it gives the characters. Each character, the two brothers, have such motivation to get through to get to you know the the points that they have to get to over the course of the film, and even even when it gets to its moment. I was like, it earned every step of the way to get through there. And it leans into what Hardy does so well is, is that he was just the brute, the, the like Mike Tyson in his prime, who just stepped into the ring, decimated whoever. Yeah. And the more people wanted to find out about him, they peeled back layers and figured out who his character was. It was fanta- fantastic. And I think that Hardy, his career is fantastic because even looking back over this, like you had to look over movies like Bronson uh, and Locke, and I know you guys love Mad Max. Locke and- is amazing. Locke uh, is a great movie with the tremendous. one in the car the whole time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Warrior can't be. It can't be topped. I mean, it's just it's such a phenomenal film. And but when I looked over all the other movies that he's been in, I couldn't not choose it. And so I'm waiting for Jake to also tell us <laughs> that he chose Warrior. Before, but Jake, before you mention, if you are mentioning Warrior, I also want to mention one other thing. And I know people talk about accents a lot in films. And I think I think accent discussions are a little bit underrated because I think people just assume, oh, actors are great. They could do accents when I I'll never forget interviewing Tom Hardy and Joel Edgerton for that junket and not knowing that Joel Edgerton was Australian Mm. when until I walked in the room. I don't know. I think I remember. And then I hearing his um, his accent for the first time, both of them just nailed it like they play american brothers perfectly yeah and they're yeah. both not american and i know that's i know it's a stand like, like same thing happened with eddie redmayne recently in trial of chicago seven like what a hell of an american accent right i mean like just like great accents are so hard to do and they're so i think people but, just assume oh you're an actor you can do an accent it's a hard thing to do and i want to give them credit for that that's i all. tried showing michelle warrior one time and she couldn't get past nolte though because 
He particularly has the gravel yeah. voice in this one where he's like, yeah. blah, blah, blah. that's his voice. That, but that casino voice. Oh, I, I mean, know. that casino he, scene. He, he, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. I, okay, anyway, Jake. Uh, I chose his performance as Bane in The Dark Knight Rises. You're wrong. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I, I recently rewatched uh, that trilogy. And 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 the and the Dark Knight Rises has plenty of faults. It's got some holes where I sort of went like, "Come on, like you're you're literally on a ticking time clock, but you took time to paint the bat symbol in gasoline so you could light it on fire." Like you, you know, there are a lot of moments that don't make sense. But to me, I, his performance as uh, he he's he's magnetic. I can't stop watching him. I like the Bane voice. I I like you know it's really the first time in that entire trilogy that Batman has a physical uh, enemy. You know, he's had a lot of enemies that have matched him on an intellectual level, but it's the first time where we genuinely see Batman get the shit. Like, that that, that fight in the sewer mm, the where brack, Bane breaks his brack, back yeah. is... I think one of the greatest superhero scenes ever. I, I mean, it's, it's so beautifully shot, and it. I mean, he is a brutally t terrifying villain. And also keep in mind, this was sort of in the wake of of like all the Wall Street movements, like in the late like early two thousands, like that first decade of the two two thousands. This was a very timely. I don't know how necessarily well it's aged, but this was a very. Remember, like the whole idea of taking over Wall Street and taking over the upper class, like that was a very timely story when Dark Knight Rises came out. And uh, I, just, I feel like his, like he, I, I loved his performance as Bane. I think he is the best part of, of a fractured movie, a movie that has its problems, but when it's good, it's good. And when it's great, it's great usually because of him. And I, I, I think it's, it's one of the all-time great superhero villains. There was I a mean, moment where yeah. Bane says something to Batman, where Batman's trying to like get away from him, and he throws like these bombs that sort of go off. Yeah. And Bane... Bane, I just looked it up in the IMDb because it's so perfect where he's like, theatricality <laughs> and, and deception. And I was like, oh, that's so awful because poor Batman's got these great tricks and Bane just like, get stuff. Get out and of here. You guys remember, I don't know how it's long so it's been since you've, since you've seen that one, but there's a, there's a beat where uh, when they're fighting in the snow at the end yeah. and he gets Batman up against a pillar and he's just ramming him in the ribs. And I mean, and Hardy is just going at it. And all of a sudden, I think, I mean, Zimmer, I'm assuming Zimmer did that score. Zimmer so. brings in the drums like that. Mm -hmm. And when they match up the drums to Hardy, just going at him and the ri it's really, yeah. it's, it's, you know, we've seen a lot of Batman movies and I think uh, up until I think Snyder took over and we sort of saw, you know, I think Snyder really tapped into the physicality and the brutality uh, potential of Batman, mm -hmm. but that was the first time we'd seen it done like that before. Right? Yeah. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah. And okay. in, in a weird turn of events, uh, when I interviewed Hardy for Warrior, he was shooting Dark Knight. Yeah, I was, I was there. I was, I was with you. Yeah, and so you could actually see like his. Remember how big his traps were? Yeah, oh, <laughs> like, dude, it was nuts. There, there was no definition between his neck and his yeah. shoulder. Like that's how large his yeah. traps were when he was shooting. Um, but I'm uh, I, the only reason I remember that specifically is because of how massive he looked in person when yeah. we interviewed yeah. him for warrior he was literally in the middle of shooting dark Knight rises that i always thought that was, that's a really cool thing when you get to like interview somebody while they're filming something yeah. he had a shaved head he was he was bane like he was in I mean, dude, dude for like i feel like for like five years when we interviewed brian cranston he always had the shaved head yeah yeah that's I true remember, I, and, and uh who is it matt damon i feel like the elysium like yes. shoot went on forever so much so that like I, I have like five or six matt damon interviews where he has a shaved head contagion I, he was shooting only, Alicia, Alicia yeah, while we interviewed him yeah. for Contagion. Yeah, I only did Hardy. I only did Hardy once for Venom. I can believe. If I, can, I can't remember if I had him for anything else. He, and he just intimidates me. And he ended up being great. But mm -hmm. is he yeah. a tough interview? He's, He's always paired. Always paired. He like, was with Reza Ahmed yeah. for Venom. Yeah. So much so that when they got him for Mad Max Fury Road. He was paired with his stunt double. Like he's always with somebody. Really? Um, like I remember the the movie the Legend. The pairing we got him for was The Revenant, and we got him paired with DiCaprio. Yeah, that was a good one. That I, was pretty I, awesome. That was cool because that was a tough one because like they're both brilliant actors, and mm. obviously you want to focus on each one. I think Hardy actually is better than DiCaprio <laughs> in The Revenant. All right, we're gonna get to uh, audience picks, uh, but I want to do one more vein thing when he says uh, how you fight like a younger man. And he's like, nothing held back. And then he goes, mm, admirable. <laughs> I love the Emmy transit before that. Mm, admirable. But mistaken. 
<laughs> I like the Bane voice. Yeah, it's not. It's 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 addicting, basically. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Audience picks. No one else picked. B- oh no, wait. I'm sorry. Someone named Prasanna. Prasanna P R S N said Bane often gets overlooked by the Joker, but he did great as a physical performer. It's that menace in his eyes, though his face is covered. Uh, Rokan Alzir said Inception. Rachel K.H. said Locke is my favorite film of his, but Bronson is my Tom Hardy favorite performance. Damien McDonnell said Locke and said the fact that it's almost a one man show and I was engaged during the whole thing. Really thin knits his best performance, closely followed by Bronson. And then L.K. Gibson said Warrior. A ton of love for Locke and Warrior across the board. And of course, Mad Max Dunkirk, and a lot of people tried to sneak in uh, Peaky Blinders, which I have not seen. Can I make a Peaky suggestion? Blinders. Really, amazing Warrior things would about. be a good commentary. I would do Warrior in a heartbeat. I want to watch it Are again. Are we still doing those? Yeah, that's, that's, no, not really. You know, up in the air. <laughs> I, I would do Warrior. I would love to watch it. Or like a viewing party. Uh, we have two different groups of people that are doing viewing parties. We'll what talk about it. Talk about it all hey, here. Yeah, I would like, hey, viewing party people. Put together a viewing party of warriors that we can all come by and watch it with you guys. All right, for don't, next week. Don't say that, because they're going to do it, and then the three of us are going to be like, yeah, we got something to do that day. Uh, Why? Well, I said, I'm let's talk loser. about it over here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gabe is the do. realist. Like, I'll throw out ideas, and he's like, yeah. Kevin, you're not going to be available to do that. No, you're not going <laughs> <laughs> to be available to do that. Jake's not going to be ready to do that. Uh, next week, hashtag, you have to do some homework. We're doing hashtag Michael Chapman blend. So let us know your pick for the late, great Michael Chapman, cool. who we just good lost. One. Really uh, good one using really hashtag Michael Chapman blend, or you can go via email at real blend at cinema blend.com. And that's where you can also send us a review. And this week's review comes from the pen man one eleven, who says one of the absolute best podcasts out there. I've been following Kevin since 2013 during the geek nation days. Oh, even- wow. wow. Yeah. Is that a deep pull Kev? That's a deep pull. I mean, I, I, do you want me to give just a quick reference to what that means? I would means? like to know what that is, yeah. Sure. Um, so years ago, when I first started doing I did this. I did the job I'm doing now for free for eight years. Um, and during that eight-year time period from 2005 till 2012, 2013, uh, I was trying to make some money with what I was doing because I was basically just traveling and doing the interviews and not getting paid anything for it. Um, so Geek Nation came to me and offered me like 100 bucks for each interview package. Hey. And I was like... And that was like gold because I was making 28 grand a year living with four roommates in Fairfax, Virginia. um, And I couldn't stop borrowing money from my parents and my friends. So I was out. They they swept they swept in. And I I remember they paid me one hundred dollars for my interview packages. And it was like it was like money to eat, basically. So that's what that's (laughs) a lot of Taco Bell. Yeah. And and, 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 over the and over the years, like I, I eventually got. A hired full time, so I switched my stuff over to Fox Five and, and their YouTube channel. But, um, but yeah, so that's 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 a really deep pull, man. Not <laughs> to cool. derail the show completely, but it feels like you and Lauren are off your Taco Bell kick. Do you guys still go as often as you used uh, to? We don't go as often as we used to, only because just because of the pandemic. But I mean, oh. I would say like we were going, we were going maybe once a week on a normal basis. Wow. Yeah, now yeah. we're going maybe once every two to three weeks, only because we've been cooking more. Lauren's actually become like like a brilliant chef. Like nice. she's uh, last night she made the most incredible scallops and asparagus and linguine dinner. It was a Monday night, and she's like, "I'm gonna make dinner tonight." I'm like awesome and we, and we had liam neeson last night for our interviews for honest thief at like eight o'clock so she made this like freaking amazing dinner so to be honest the reasoning for that is she, we've been cooking more gotcha um so yeah <clears throat> anyway i digress Sorry. uh yeah, anyway. <laughs> pen man ele- uh pen man 11 goes on to say i was drawn to kevin's genuine excitement and unique questions during his interviews and his unabashed willingness to mention his nerd tears hashtag nerd tears <laughs> Yeah. I also saw his short film Ooh. Bump and even hey. once sent him Sorry. an idea for a short film. Uh, I learned about Jake a few years later after catching his funny interview with Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> Smart move, Jake, he writes. <laughs> Sean, you were the last of the party and couldn't suck more. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, you were the last of the party as I discovered you when Awards Blend started. Anyway, the podcast is awesome with blend games and interviews, keeping each episode fresh week to week and passionate discussions about certain topics prompt me to take sides almost all the time. I end up on Jake's side more often than not. P.S. Your podcast, along with some others, inspired me to start my own 
sports and entertainment podcast called the All Around Podcast that I do with my brother, and it provides a nice break from work and other obligations. So thanks for the content and keep, excuse me, keep kicking ass. I'm drinking so much water and it's just coming back up on me during this entire thing. Thank you so much for that review. That was fantastic. I want to thank uh, Penman for writing that that fantastic review for all of us. <laughs> what? I can't. I got through the whole thing. I made it so close. Um, we've been seeing so much support, obviously, for the show. You guys have been reaching out uh, through emails. Keep putting reviews on the Apple podcast. And you guys can also subscribe to the premium show, which is available uh, at bit.ly backslash real blend premium. Our next premium episode they're going to be recording is a mailbag. So we want you guys to submit questions. So go to uh, either social media and hit us up with a question at real blend. If you want to follow us there, send us a question to real blend at cinemablend.com and we will answer them during the premium episode next week. Um, that's all I got. Follow us on social media at Jake's takes at Kevin McCarthy TV at Sean underscore O'Connell and the show at real blend. Okay, do we have a guest next week that we know of? It ain't Sorkin. Potentially. Yeah. We have a guest coming up. Yes. 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 We do? But Good. Uh, hashtag Excellent. if it happens. Hashtag if it happens. All right. So until next week, um, we will talk to you guys soon. Thank you very much for all your support and for listening and watching. And until uh, we meet again, the game. Scallops and asparagus. There you go. That, that's all. That also works too.